So thank you and good morning. So first of all, just wanted to say thank you um, to IFSJ for putting on a fantastic event and thank you to everyone that's turned up today. Um, it's my first time here. Um, hugely impressive in terms of the turnout um, and such a diverse range of everyone that's kind of turned up. So what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about vehicle fire safety. So to some of you in the room, it might be a new topic. To some of you in the room, you might have experience of it. So I've got nine minutes and 15 seconds to tell you everything I know about vehicles. So without further ado, so what we're going to cover quickly, we're going to cover why fire protection is important in vehicles. We're going to cover what is the new law that governs vehicle fire protection in um, the UAE how our system works, which is a good example of how a lot of common systems can work, so it will give you a good overview, and what, <coughs> what, it, what makes React on special in their attention to detail in terms of how they design and manufacture systems. So fire safety in the UAE. So 2022, there were over a 1,000 vehicle fires in the UAE for that year, which works out roughly at about three per day. So... If we look at that and we think, okay, what are the common risk factors with vehicles? One of the things you'll no doubt obviously know is vehicles come in various different shapes, sizes from various different manufacturers. So it makes designing a system suitable for vehicles extremely challenging because every manufacturer does things differently. The design of a vehicle is different. The risk analysis and risk profile of a vehicle its potential fire sources all change when the vehicle changes. So when we look at the other risk factors we have, like higher temperatures, we all know how hot it is out here. That increases engine bay temperatures of vehicles. That then has a compounding effect when there is a fire. Um, we look at congested roads, which make a big difference again to vehicle engine temperatures. And the engine is being a key point to this, but there are other fire sources other than engines that can cause issues like brakes on trailers. It's a very common one on um, vehicle transporters. So main causes of vehicles. So we've been doing this a very long time. We've got a lot of data for what we see in terms of what causes fires, not only in on-road vehicles, but in off-highway plant as well. Poor maintenance is a significant factor. So leaking combustible fluids, oils, grease that are subjected to high temperatures will have an auto combustion temperature. Um, if we go on quickly, so impact of, of not having a fire system or a suitable fire system on the vehicle um, is evacuation from vehicles can be challenging. So we have some people who are able-bodied who can move quickly if there's an issue with a vehicle. You also have some people who are not able to move very quickly. A great case of this in the UK is that nearly... I would say over 95% of the private and government ambulances are fitted with a fire suppression system. That led from, as we saw in a previous presentation, an incident where a patient was unable to be evacuated from the vehicle that caught fire. Um, and we're just going to touch on some of the changes, the new mandate and the UAE bus standard. So UAE 5041, so what is it? It's the new vehicle or new bus fire suppression standard for the UAE. It compromises of various um, standards that have come together and the teams have looked at the important factors of the various standard and created the bespoke standard that you now have today. Um, the adaptions are very good that have been made to the standard that include key parts to... Um, durability of the system, um, looking at the temperature exposure of the system is very important, as we previously discussed. Um, Sheikh Mohammed obviously announced that it will be mandatory to install an approved fire suppression system on buses in the UAE. More and more countries worldwide are introducing this. It's European law on certain classifications of buses. And coming next year in Europe, it will be a mandatory requirement for hazardous vehicles to also have a fire suppression vehicle. So an example of that are fuel tankers. So more and more countries that look at these risks understand how much hazard and potential hazard vehicle fires can cause. 
it's fantastic to see the progress the UAE has made on not only looking at the standard, but understanding the reporting. You know, it's something that is so poor in so many areas is reporting, and reporting enables us to learn from the previous issues we've had. So risk of not complying, like we've talked about, the risk of damage, the loss of life, definitely you can see plenty of case studies where this has happened, and some vehicle fires are not slow um, to start. They can be very quick to start, and they can consume a vehicle very, very quickly. So what makes a compliance system? So this is a great example of it. So we see a standard and we see a certificate. But what does that mean? It means that on a vehicle system, we're looking at very robust, tightly controlled fire testing, very, very tough mechanical tests. And we're going to have a look at that a little bit further on in the presentation. Documentation. So in the fixed fire world or in building fire, you, you have a huge, vast archive of standards, codes, training, how people should be trained, what the standards involve that include training, surveying, etc. Unfortunately, in the vehicle world, there's very little of that. So it, a lot of it has been, in the previous years, left down to the manufacturers to dictate what level. And that is why the standard is so important, because it governs what the documentation should look like, what testing should look like. Being out and seeing the factory where these systems are produced are so important because understanding the quality, how things are made, and making sure what is tested on that certificate is actually what's being delivered um, to the customer and i.e. fitted to a vehicle. So I'm just going to play this video. So this just gives you a very simple example of how the system works. So. The system traditionally consists of what I would describe as three major components. You have a detection system, you have a agent storage pressure vessel that contains the extinguishing agent that also deals with the actuation of the system, and then you have the discharge network. So what, you, what we try to engineer or have engineered through the years and kept engineering is keeping this as simple as possible. These systems, unlike fixed fire systems, do not get the luxury of being in a, a hotel, um, you know, a, an office block where it's a controlled environment. You know, it's, it's very static. These systems are often subjected to some of the harshest conditions. Um, you know, and you've got to think in broad terms. It's not only vehicles on road, but off road. Um, and the durability for me is the key engineering aspect of what we do. So sort of what quality looks like, so the various tests that these systems have to go through. So we're looking at temperature cycling, we're looking at um, humidity, ingress, we're looking at salt corrosion. It's not particularly a big issue out here, but certainly in Europe it's a massive issue. Um, and a significant amount, of, like I said, of durability and vibration testing. The key element to engineering these types of systems is what I call factor of safety. These systems are going to be fitted in a large volume. The systems, in some cases, might not be seen for a prolonged period of time. So it's not just about passing a standard and having a certificate. It's about making sure the company that makes these things have a deep interest in making sure the quality of the systems is at the best possible standard it can be. And for me, the goal, when we look at things like durability testing like this, um, we, we're looking for a huge safety effect with durability. And the art of doing this is creating a fantastically durable product without over-engineering it to the point that it becomes yeah, inaccessible um, uh, for the people that want to fit it. There has to strike a balance. If we want to see a significant improvement and uptake in these systems, yeah. we have to find this great factor of safety superior yeah. quality, but we also have to remember that in order to have a great uptake, that must have an acceptable price point. And that is what we've been fantastic at doing. This is just another example of some of the fire testing that you can see, the, the, the test rig here, and uh, you can come and ask us for, th I've got thousands of videos. <laughs> I've lost count of all the videos we have, but I mean, just gives you an I example in terms of he, he, an engine mock-up. You can see kind of the various different um, tests that we do. And it's designed just to simulate a standard enclosure and give some form of repeatability to this testing to benchmark the systems. 
Um, again, it's, it, it, because vehicle engine bays are so different, even same manufacturer to different volume, they are completely different. So again, what we do, we've, so far in the UAE, we've done 2,000 school buses and around about 1,000 taxis. We're awarded the Fire Safety Excellence Award at, um, for our UAE bus protection program. Um, we're the first approved system in the UAE um, under the new law. Um, and yeah, not to go over the points of cuff, but for me, as Terry talked about, and thank you very much wherever he is for talking out, but for me, it's been a relentless journey of trying to find this unbelievable standard of product that customers can fit and can absolutely rely on all the time to make sure it's protecting their vehicles, it's as robust as possible, and it's made with the absolute integrity of enhancing vehicle safety. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Ed. And I, I, think, I think there's a clue in the name, actually, and, and this is going to be a surprise to him, oh, but no. I've just thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. React on. They react. It reacts to the risk. And I think that's the whole point of it, you, is reacting to the type of risk. The risk is potentially, initially, school children on a bus. Yep. But they need protection. They need the best. And, and if you spin that up to a plant that's operating within a tunnel, for example, or a plant that's yeah. operating in a, in a mega project, a giga project, which, it, which I'm involved with, it needs protection. You, you, you've got lots of lives that potentially could be lost. So I think it's key that, you know, okay, we can always look for a cheaper alternative, yeah. but have they reacted to that risk? when they manufacture their items. And I'm sorry that sounds like a sales pitch because I'm not a salesman, but I'm passionate about protecting lives. Do you, yep. I have one question if you have time. Yes. Uh, I'm Dr. Andrew again, and, and thank you that your, your statements just led into this question about reacting to risk. So as you know, PFAS and PFOA has yep. now been made a carcinogen. Uh, it's a, listed as a carcinogen as of December 20, 2023. How has Reacton uh, reacted to the uh, listing of PFOA and the PFAS chemicals in general, uh, and do they, are they included in your fire safety? Yeah, so we, because we protect such a diverse customer base, um, as, as we know, the standards have moved very quickly in this subject, you know, almost overnight in considering other areas of fire that can take a lot longer. Um, traditionally, you've obviously got the clean agent side, less relevant in, in vehicles, but a significant part of this is foams, yeah? So foams in, in our industry are generally split by industry. So um, quite interestingly, we know the effects of PFAS and PFOAs in, in water environments, in water habitats. Um, actually, on land applications have pretty much shifted away from any fluorine-based foams, yeah? So most of our vehicle systems that we either use as a primary agent for foam or we use as combined agents with, with dry chemical and foam are now completely free of it. And all our new recent approvals are all without that chemical. Strangely, one of the industries that still requests it is marine. So it's, it's a bit strange because those messages, as you just talked about, seem to be transcending at different paces, if that makes sense. So I think like AFFF has been such an important and effective um, agent that convincing certain industries to be fluorine free in those aspects is, is hard. But certainly from what we've done is we only, we've moved away from that, but there are some, still some customers that need further education. And I think as well, to be fair to the fire industry with, with those chemicals or those the, the, the PFAS side is that it's the products haven't been good enough in the early stages. You know, when you did, I'm sure you know this, but as you've done fire testing between the two, there has been a significant performance difference between the two. But what's great is, especially in the last two, three years, that performance gap is completely closed. So like I said, for all our vehicle and on land applications and marine, if they specify it, we're now free of it on vehicles and, and foam agents. Obviously, there's still clean agents in the market, um, but realistically, we're going to be left with like FK512. Um, you know, certainly FM200 for us is not a, not a, not an issue anymore. Thank you. I think there's one more question.
Another question. I'm getting all the questions. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Azhar Ahmed. I take care of the fire and life safety operations at the Louvre Abu Dhabi Museum. Uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, regarding the, I have seen in the, in the video, I have seen that uh, the, the separation agent, it is coming outside the compartment. So yeah. unlike the FM200, we do the, the third party room integrity testing to control it. So how you do, uh, how you address this uh, in your uh, separation system? Yeah, it's, uh, so uh, when we talked about chemicals earlier, um, obviously you've got local application and sort of total flooding are the two sort of classifications for our system. For us, we test, especially on vehicles, with huge openings, yeah? So a lot of the, and Terry talked about other manufacturers, you'll find that they will give you a performance rating in a sealed box, and you'll often see videos of various other vehicle fire suppression manufacturers with a box that's tightly sealed on all four corners with no airflow with a fire in it. So one of the reasons we use dry chemical as a primary agent in vehicles is because, again, of the factor of safety. Because, as you know, in an engine bay, it, although we saw the back of the vehicle open when it was discharging, we've got to remember in most applications for on-road vehicles is there's nothing on the floor. Yeah, it's completely open. So we, when we design systems, we design them in terms of cubic capacity, in terms of factor of safety, but our systems are certified to be fully open. So what that means is we design our systems so an engine bay totally unenclosed, the system is still able to provide the level of density and coverage that it needs to. So you have these factors of safety with levels of openness, but we test to right to the extreme where there is no enclosure around the engine bay. So obviously having an enclosure around an engine bay does enhance it, but the Actually, an opening like you saw there is not the major problem. The major problem in vehicles is the extraction or inlet of cooling air. If you think about how powerful your car fan is when it's hot, that is the major risk with a vehicle. So, you know, controlling when you shut down fans and how you deal with that airflow is also tested during the fire testing as well. I hope that answers some of the question. Thank you.